Welcome to Ancient Faith Presents. I'm Bobby Maddox, the Director of Digital Media for Ancient Faith Ministries. And today I will be speaking with Graham Sparkman. He is the artist behind the new album, Pasca Dawn. Welcome to the program, Graham. Thank you so much, Bobby, for having me on. Always a delight to be on Ancient Faith. Well, before we discuss your new album, tell me a little bit about yourself. I know you've been on the show many times, but it would probably be a good reminder. Talk a little bit about yourself and your background, uh, both musically and otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. For folks who are hearing me for the first time on on Ancient Faith, uh, Bobby's been nice enough to interview (laughs) me in the past for a few different album releases uh, the first one being in 2017, I put out an album called Lestovka. And I think the name of that episode was From Bluegrass to the Beatitudes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can look that up in the archives if you're interested in hearing a more thorough um, explanation of my musical background and how I discovered uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Uh, but for sake of this interview, I'd love to give you a little synopsis. Uh, So I was born in 1978. Uh, I'm from Kentucky, a native of southeastern Kentucky. I grew up in a small uh, Appalachian coal mining town called Hazard, Kentucky, down in sort of the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. I come from a musical family, uh, five generations on my father's side of uh, unbroken musicians, and at least three generations on my mother's side that we know of. Uh, My dad was um, and still is a guitar player, but was in a successful Southern gospel band in the 1980s called the Cornerstones, and they had a record deal down in Nashville, Tennessee with Harvest Records, and they had a big touring bus. So on the weekends, I spent many weekends with my dad and his band touring all over different parts of the country, and I got to see different aspects of the professional music industry from sound check and setting up in in big events, big venues, all the way to playing in little tiny churches and staying in hotels, the whole gamut. Uh, And then my grandfather, if you back up a generation, (laughs) was in a band, a string band in the 1940s called the Kentucky Hilltoppers. And he decided that he wasn't going to be able to make ends meet with his little string band. (laughs) So he decided to get into radio. So he went to professional broadcasting school in the early 1950s and ended up coming back to work in the radio that he was playing a few years prior with his string band as a board operator. He eventually became a supervisor, the station manager, and then became the owner of Mountain Broadcasting Systems, which is a series of radio stations in East Kentucky, which is still in operation to this very day. So when I was about eight years old, I started formal drum lessons for about a year. At age 12, I picked up guitar because my dad was a guitar collector and already playing guitar, so that was an easy fit. My mother was a pianist in in our church. I was raised uh, in a Protestant, uh, non-denominational church. And I don't know about you, Bobby, but because you also (laughs) grew up in a radio family. But when I got dropped off from school, I would always be dropped off at the radio station. I'd have to wait for my dad to get off of work. And so what I would do is I would find an empty studio. It was usually the talk back room. And I would thumb through, you know, the vinyl collection, whether it was my dad's personal collection or vinyls at the station. And I would find one that had an interesting, you know, artwork on the cover and I'd throw it on the turntable and they had a lazy boy (laughs) recliner chair in the (laughs) studio. And I would sit in there with all the lights off. And I remember seeing the flickering ambient glow of the analog outboard gear and the VU meters. This would have been in the late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. And if I found an album that I really liked that I would, I would ask my dad to dub it off onto cassette for me because in those days I could put it in my Sony Walkman and listen to it on the way to school. Right. Mixtapes. Come <laughs> so, on. Yeah. Y- yeah. It was, it was our generation's way of, of, of having portable music back in the day. <laughs> so mixtapes, the whole nine yards. Yeah. And so I, a lot of my music education and, and listening to music in different genres was just being able to comb through the vast collection of vinyls down at the station. And so, you know, everything from Ravi Shankar to Aldi Miola, oh, Chikubia, wow. yeah. and Maha Vishnu Orchestra, and John McLaughlin, and Weather Report, all of those albums I got to, to experience at a relatively young age. So, and that very much informed me as a musician even to this very day. Um, so fast forward and I went to an international high school in Lake Wells, Florida. And um, my roommates were primarily from the Caribbean, uh, South America, had one roommate from Japan, but we played what we called, you know, world football, what Americans call soccer. (laughs) And so we, a lot of music there too, in high school, coming from international places. So although I grew up in South East, southeastern Kentucky with what we would (laughs) generically refer to as hillbilly music. (laughs) And that was certainly a big part of the backdrop of my musical upbringing, I also had this huge uh, repertoire of of international music uh, that I was exposed to 
um, all through my teen years. Uh, into my 20s, I started uh, leading worship because, again, I was coming from out of that Protestant uh, denomination. I led worship for my Baptist student union in college, and then I went on to um, do international missionary work for an international interdenominational missionary organization. And I did a, a music school or a school for musicians that trained worship leaders in Lakeside, Montana. And we had music theory. They had a recording studio on the base. Um, we got to do songwriting. Um, and I traveled over to India as part of our outreach. And while there, I actually, because of my love of Indian classical music, I picked up sitar and had a few little wow. like, sitar lessons yeah. while in India. Brought the sitar back. That was interesting on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had to take it on a third class train all the way across India from Pune up to Nagaland in the extreme northeastern part of the country. Somehow managed. Uh, but you know, when you're in your early 20s, you can do sure. amazing things. <laughs> yeah. So came back and then uh, started writing some more songs and went into a recording studio with my brother in the early 2000s. And we went to record um, a full length album. And I knew right then and there that if uh, just based on how expensive it was to pay, you know, <laughs> rent out a studio and pay an, uh, a board operator, an engineer to run the session and all the studio musicians in those days, you, you know, that's how you had to do it. I realized it's sort of like a feed a man, a fish, you know, teach <laughs> a man to fish thing. Like right. if I wanted to continue producing albums and not rack up thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, I needed to learn how to do this for myself. So that's what uh, got me on the path of music production and, and learning audio engineering and mixing. So, and I've been on that path for 20 years. I've been married to my wife, uh, Clarissa, for 22 years. Okay. We have four children. The oldest, Medora, she's 15. She just got her driver's permit. And she, that's been <laughs> that's scary. keeping me on pins and needles. <laughs> uh, my two boys, uh, Casimir is 11 and Ambrose is nine. And they love to annoy and beat the living tar out of each other on a regular <laughs> basis. And then the baby girl, which she's now six, uh, is Iona. So those are my four children. And we now live in northeastern Minnesota in Duluth on the banks of lovely Lake Superior. And I attend 12 Holy Apostles Greek Orthodox Church. In fact, I was uh, recently invited to be on church council. So I'm now the vice president oh, nice. of um, our parish council. So that's a little bit about my background. And thanks for asking me, Bobby. Yeah. So uh, um, it's, it's very evident, uh, Graham, that your past experience and all that you've developed over the course of the years, I mean, this music is really excellent. Uh, the production quality is outstanding. Uh, I just want to make sure that listeners know that like, this is not an individual just like dabbling um, on the side. Uh, <laughs> like you are, you're, yeah, you're a true pro. And so uh, I really do hope that they will uh, listen to some of your material. And speaking of which, uh, let's talk about this new album. Um, it's a sequel of sorts. Yeah. So uh, we discussed in a prior program uh, your, your, you know, your previous album. So talk about that previous album. Uh, what was the nature of recording that? Uh, and, and how is that, how did that end up being received? Absolutely. So, the previous album was an album that I put out called Nativity Fire. And as Orthodox Christians, we are very well aware of our liturgical hymns. And we think of that as being Orthodox music. And it is, and rightfully so. Um, what a lot of Orthodox Christians don't understand, and I include myself in this prior to doing these albums and doing all this research, is that in these ancient Orthodox uh, countries or lands, regions of the world, we're talking about the Mediterranean, the Middle East, you know, North Africa, Eastern Europe, there exists hundreds and hundreds of year old traditions of uh, folk music, which exists in these regions where Eastern Orthodox Christians composed folk music, nothing that you would hear in embedded in a church service, but you would hear it um, maybe as part of uh, certain feast day celebrations in people's homes where, you know, they're raising a glass, whatever version of Shlivovitz they have in their given country to toast. And um, you know, maybe it's part of a name day celebration. Maybe it's, I think in Serbia, they had the Slava celebrations. And so naturally, because uh, they had just come out of a church service, maybe even hours prior, uh, you know, it's, it's only natural to think that, you know, out comes the bazooki or out comes the hand <laughs> flute. And now they're, now they're singing about uh, these different feast day occasions uh, that they were celebrating only hours prior in, in church. And so, uh, you know, there is this folk tradition that is quite ancient that exists in these different um, regions of the world. And myself becoming aware of, of these traditions uh, and being a folk, coming from a folk background myself, pursuing Appalachian music and traditional bluegrass music, I got the idea, how cool would it be 
to take these ancient Eastern folk Christian songs, have them translated into the English language with the idea of presenting recordings for the first time in English. Uh, of course, I had to write new arrangements that paid homage to the ancient versions, but that was sort of the scope to Nativity Fire, and it was the first time I ever pursued anything like that. Yeah. And once the album was completed, uh, of course, we had an interview for that uh, project as well, Bobby. Uh, the interview went out. I started getting reciprocation back from all places of the world. People in Europe started sending me emails. Oh, hey, wow. Hey, I heard your interview on Ancient Faith. It was tremendous. I'm, I've been extremely blessed by your album. There's nothing else kind of like that. Um, so just based on the sheer positive support and reciprocation I got back, it motivated me to want to do a sequel album. Again, because when I was, maybe it's you can't see the forest for the trees <laughs> or the trees for the forest, however that goes. But when I was working on Nativity Fire, I didn't probably even realize how unique the project was at the time until until it kind of went out, and then I realized, oh, there, there, you know, this is kind of unique. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe I should do another one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you know, the the reception of the first album uh, kind of inspired uh, you know the idea to produce a second album. You know, what else went into there? Like, why did you choose Pasca? Why did you choose the title Pasca Dawn? Great questions. So, because you know, Pasca being actually the largest feast that we have on our liturgical calendar. You know, it's kind of interesting because in the West, you know, Western Christians celebrate Easter. But uh, one of my parishioners was joking with me a few weeks back. He said, you know, we don't really have folk music about Easter here. I mean, what, are they going to write a song about the Easter bunny you know, <laughs> in the West? <laughs> but in the East, it's a different story. Uh, you know, there's, there's, they're rich in, in their repertoire of, of folk music uh, in conjunction with Holy Week, not just Pascha, but Holy Week, all the events leading up to the death and ultimately the resurrection of our Lord. Um, so... Just because I knew that that material was probably out there and it was just going to be a matter of collecting it and getting it translated. It worked for Nativity Fire, so chances are <laughs> that it could work for you know a Pasca project as a sequel. Sure. And then the album title, I think you had asked a question yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. So Nativity Fire is a two-word title uh, that has to do with the feast itself, Nativity, and fire. Now, the fire part might be kind of interesting for folks. Where did that come from? So it actually came out of the liturgical hymns and the liturgical prayers, which were utilized as part of that project. So time and time again, I kept hearing this word fire come up. Um, I can't remember them now off the top of my head because it's been four years since I was doing that project. But if you go back and listen, it's like uh, prefigured by the bush unburned, the hallowed oh, yeah, uh, sure. womb yeah. has born, you know, and even in the folk songs themselves, um, out of fiery love, you descend from heaven in a, a Serbian folk song. So this word fire kept coming up. And I, so the album sort of named itself in that way. And for Pasca Dawn being a sequel, I knew I wanted a sort of a play off that two word title uh, scenario. So I went with Pasca being the feast, obviously, and Dawn, because once again, there was all this beautiful word imagery that kept coming up of our Lord's resurrection. Yeah. In fact, um, one of the hymns that we sing, I think on, Holy Friday uh, says, Now art thou hidden like the setting sun beneath mm. the earth and covered by the night of death. But, O Savior, rise in the brighter dawn. So those kind of hymns and prayers sort of informed the shape and even yeah. the artwork, even the album cover um, for folks, obviously, you probably haven't seen it yet because it's not been released, but <laughs> Jennifer Sorensen did an amazing job, and she was one of the repeat cast members that I got back. I knew I wanted to have her back to make it feel like a true sequel, so she did the artwork okay. for this project as well. And you can see the, the Earth sort of eclipsed by a shadow and then the, the sun sort of rising. So that's yeah. that whole word imagery. Yeah, I was going to mention that cover. Uh, it really is striking. Uh, it looks like almost like there's a um, like the sun is exploding off the side of the Earth. It's, it's really beautiful. Uh, she did a fabulous job. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to talk about your collaborators here in a second. But first, mm -hmm. uh, let's listen to one of the tracks. Uh, what would you like to play at the outset here? So this first song is Night of the Last Supper, and it comes out of the Egyptian sort of Coptic folk tradition. I first heard a version of this song, um, and it was very kind of stripped down. I think they only had one or two little percussion elements and then an oud um, and it had already been translated into English, so I didn't have to worry about that, which, which just made it be, you know, sort of a perfect fit for sure. this album. So it was really up to me just to kind of write a new arrangement and hire all new musicians, um, and, and, and singers to kind of pull it off. So my version is 
is it's very heavy production. <laughs> I think when you when you hear the old phrase, bring out your cast of thousands, you know, that, that, that's what I feel like this song kind of entailed. But uh, it's sort of a microcosm too of the entire album because you hear a little bit of that chanted prayer in the beginning, which sets the stage. And then it kind of, you know, escalates from there into full-blown, you know, Egyptian folk mo- mode. Awesome. Well, let's listen to it. For sure. The Lord, the King of all and our Creator God, has been clothed in our human nature without undergoing change. He himself is our Passover and has offered himself to those whom he wished to save by his death. Take and eat, this is my body. You shall find food for your faith. O God most good, you yourself Fill the cup of joy that frees the human race. You offer yourself in sacrifice, and you make your disciples drink from it, saying, Take and drink, this is my blood. You shall find food for your faith. Supper 
So that was beautiful, Graham, and uh, it's so interesting to me, uh, you know, there's the style of music, but yet it still seems so sacred. How did you achieve that balance? That is a difficult balance to achieve, and I'm not even sure I always pull it off 100% effectively, (laughs) but I try my best. (laughs) I try to somehow tap into the, the heart of the original version that inspires me. And then I just follow that sort of marching to the beat of my own drum, always making out, you know, edits as I go along. I always start with tons of stuff and then that gets stripped down and stuff gets added back. There's lots of accidents that happy that happen a- along the way. Some of them happy accidents, some of them not so happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then ultimately you hope at the end of the day, you end up with a song that on some sort of intuitive gut level, you know that if it puts a smile on my face and makes me kind of nod my head a little bit when I'm listening to it. It could do that for others. So, you know, when I'm not hearing anything in the mix that's bugging me, things that need to be fixed, and it's it's doing what I set out to do to begin with, that's how I kind of know it's done and it's ready. Yeah. Well, you mentioned one of your your cover artists is one of your um, sequel collaborators, uh, but I know that mm-hmm. a lot of people were involved. So what did it take to mm-hmm. put this new album together? Um, and then how, do, how is it funded? Mm, yeah. So... <laughs> You know, I thought I had a lot of folks on Nativity Fire, and I and I did. But retrospectively, looking back, <laughs> uh, that it was that was a pretty small cast of folks compared to this project. Um, I never was really paying attention to how many people I had signed up for this project along the way because you're just kind of plowing through. And this, I'll also say that this project took me all of four years to complete, which makes it the makes it the longest album that I've ever worked on from start to finish. Part of that was due to the fact that. You know, I started this project in early 2020, and then we had this kind of like sickness rolling across the globe, which uh, put a halt to, um, you know, having folks in person in my studio for a good chunk. I had to roll over and work on some other albums. In the span of that time, I did a children's jazz album, and I did an ambient project, and I had to kind of bring those to completion before I could jump back over to the Posca project. But yeah, four years, and then I finally did a head count when it was all said and done, and including graphic designers and the artists and all of the musicians and the translators and everything. It was 54, (laughs) I think 54 people I hired, not including myself, (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you know, so that, uh, yeah. And I did have in order to, for it to feel like a true sequel, you know, you've got to get some of the cast members back from the original, you know, if you think about movies like, you know, the karate kid, if uh, <laughs> right. Pat Morita or Ralph Macho hadn't yeah. come back. In fact, some of those old, you know, later karate kids with different, <laughs> just doesn't feel like it's part of the same thing. So I had to get Father Tim back to do the chanted prayers because he was on Nativity Fire. He's that iconic, you know, he's got his, he's from Romania originally. So he's got a little bit of that tinge of the Romanian accent in there and a, a bold, a beautiful chanting voice. So I got him back for this project. And then, uh, as I mentioned, Jennifer Swanson came back to do all the album art. 
my godfather uh, who's singing bass parts. He's in my home parish. He came back and others as well. So definitely got some repeat folks back for this project. And then how is it funded? Well, I fund everything out of my own wallet. Um, oh, geez. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and that's another reason it took me four years because I had to kind of you know string it along. I couldn't pay for all of that in one small chunk. So, yep. um, you know, in, in 2024, it, there's a, it's a double-edged sword with music production because, you know, people stream music for free and you have to get like – I don't know, like a 50 billion streams before you see like, you know, $25 roll in. Right. Uh, I think it was like Rolling Stone magazine or <laughs> else maybe Sound on Sound magazine that recently I was reading, put out um, an article and it said, if Taylor Swift could not support herself on streams alone, then we're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Of course, she's selling out huge arenas and has franchises and, you know, endorsements and all other ev- avenues for for revenue, but uh, for for the for the one percent of folks that are actually chasing money, that that tends to work. But for the rest of us in music production, especially independent music producers, it's it's tough. Um, there's never been more um, technology and collaboration. In fact, I hired uh, the the foremost accordion player for this project out of Croatia, and it was very affordable. Uh, if you were to try to do that decades ago, that would have just been you know way more expensive and impossible. Right. But so we, we have all of this flexibility to collaborate and, and, but when you do hire 54 people, it adds up pretty quickly. So, (laughs) so there are ways for people to uh, contribute financially. If you want to support me as an independent music producer, the the art that I, or the music that I put out, uh, you can get in touch with me through grahamsparkman.com. There's a contact uh, section. You can shoot me an email and I can send you some instructions on how you can uh, contribute. So there, there are those ways, but yeah, for this project, definitely I funded everything, including promotional, just the whole nine yards out of my own wallet. So it's a true labor of love. Yeah. That's kind of unbelievable. So you're, you're paying for this, uh, you know, on your own dime, um, mm-hmm. you are doing extra slash, I mean, extra dash liturgical music. So it's, you know, it's outside of the liturgy, reflective mm-hmm. of the, the liturgy. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, uh, you know, how big the audience for that is. Like, why are you doing these things? What is the aim here? Why are you, why are you producing these albums? I think that question really points at how I discovered orthodoxy myself, because it was through music that was not liturgical music, interestingly enough. So, uh, I think in the very first interview that we did, Bobby, I was talking about Arvo Pert and yeah, his music yep. and how he writes these sort of paraliturgical hymns as well as compositions for whole orchestras and involved in these huge projects. And for folks that don't know his work, I mean, he's a musical genius. He's basically written a new musical language with his signature minimalistic style. That music, before I even knew what orthodoxy was, was so inspiring to me that I wanted to learn about Arvo Perret and who he was and come to find out that he was from Estonia, that he's an Eastern Orthodox Christian and that his faith informs a lot of his composition. Um, And so it was sort of that side angle approach to introducing me to Orthodoxy that made me interested in, you know, trying to contact a priest and having conversations over coffee and then attending a liturgy and then, you know, fast forward whatever, nine years and then I became Orthodox. And so... If, if it did that for me, I, I, th- I think there's so many folks out there who might not even know what the Orthodox Church is or might not even ever go to a liturgy where they're going to hear our liturgical music. And maybe these kind of projects, it is my hope anyways, that they could encounter Christ in his church uh, through through the folk tradition as sort of a side, a side avenue into Orthodoxy. Awesome. Well, let's listen to another track, uh, Graham. What would you like to play now? So this is Christ is Risen. It's not the liturgical version. It's a Ukrainian folk version by the same title. There, there's a real brief story that I have to share first, Bobby, if you, if you have just a second oh, here about yes. this Go song ahead. in particular. Yeah. It's absolutely hilarious. So I was working with a young girl in Ukraine named Yulia Vitrunuk, and she specializes in Ukrainian folk music. Obviously, I can't speak Ukrainian. So I said, hey, Yulia, why don't you find me a, um, a folk Pasca song uh, that's authentically Ukrainian. She's like, oh yeah, no problem. A week goes by. She's like, hey, I got your song. It's going to be great. And I say, okay, yeah, get me, send me what you got. So she sends me a YouTube version of these three, you know, babushkas, <laughs> and they're sitting around a kitchen table. And this again, this is a YouTube video, and they're singing in Ukrainian. And it's all it's earthy. I like the melody and the harmony structure. I'm like, this is going to be fabulous. So then I pay 
a translator to translate the lyrics into English. And another week goes by. Then I get the translation back and I'm reading the translation and it goes something like this. This young guy is in the field and he's working with his young friends and they're high-fiving each other because he likes this girl and there's plans for them to get married. So they go off to the tavern and they have a bunch <laughs> of wine. And meanwhile, the girl goes to the witch Oh no! Uh, and the witch <laughs> gives the girl a root to boil. And so she takes the root home because that's going to give their marriage fidelity and blessings and all this kind of weird stuff. And that's it. And <laughs> that's how the song concludes. So I go back to Yulia, the original girl that sent me, you know, the, the YouTube video. And I say, Yulia, I, they're like, I'm a little confused here. Bear with me. But there's nothing in here about Pasca or our Lord's resurrection. She said, Oh, I just, I just said that this was a folk song. We sing it Pasca. I didn't say, oh, <laughs> I didn't yeah. say it had anything to do with Pasca. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the whole lost in translation thing. Perhaps, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. That's funny. There, so evidently there are folk songs that people sing around the feast days that have nothing to do <laughs> with the actual <laughs> feast. <laughs> sure. So I said, you know, I wish I knew that a hundred dollars ago before I paid to have this one translated. <laughs> uh, so anyways, it was back to the drawing board. And I said, well, can, can you, I was more clear this time. I said, can you actually get me a song that lyrically has to do with, you know, the resurrection of our Lord? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. So <laughs> wait another week. She gets a song. She gives it to me again in Ukrainian. So I send it back to the same translator, waiting for the translation to come. That week goes by, that comes back. And you know how in a lot of these folk songs across the world, the songs will be titled by the first lyric of the song sure so i open up like the word document from the translator and i kid you not the first line is the hot girl <laughs> and <laughs> and i start i'm like oh man here we go again and so i start reading through the first like stanza and i see what ha what's happened is it's a literal translation it's a hot young girl was tending her garden uh -huh. so what they're trying to say is that she was warm in the hot sun <laughs> yeah. she was perspiring <laughs> And I'm thinking, no American, no Western English speaking person is going to interpret that that way. <laughs> right. So I took a liberty to switch that lyric to a pretty young maid was tending her garden or something like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I ended up singing. You're going to hear it here in just a few seconds. So I just had to share that with you before we play <laughs> it. It's a great song. story. All right, let's listen yeah. to it now.
Just beautiful, Graham. So I want to discuss with you, I mean, you've kind of delved into this a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit about the intersection between, you know, ancient hymnography and reimaginings such as yours. I mean, this is not uh, just something that is occurring in your case. I mean, there are orthodox musicians such as the band Luxury, uh, mm, do you know what I mean? Yes, who, who are absolutely. Who are presenting um, orthodox truth, but mm-hmm. in a different format from, uh, you know, uh, liturgical music. So what is your general philosophy on the appropriateness of mm-hmm. riffing on liturgical music and uh, representing it to a different sort of audience? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. So I think right out of the gate, I'm going to say that I believe that we should have a separation between secular and sacred. And I do think that there's a time and a place for both of these things to coexist, speaking about the liturgical demography and the folk music in their own spheres. I'm not in any way trying to say that we should start bringing all these instruments into the church and incorporating this music into part of our liturgical you know, tradition, which has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit over time. Uh, but, they, but they do have a unique place, and, and I do think that it's appropriate to think of them in that regard. I think where it gets a little confusing is then people would come back to me and say, well, then why did you include these sort of liturgical chanted prayers Mm -hmm. on your otherwise folk album? And that's a completely legitimate question. Think of it this way. If you're exiting a church at the end of a major feast, you might hear bells ringing in the background. You might hear even somebody chanting out from scripture as you're departing the service. In the case of the nativity in my parish, and I've experienced this in other parishes as well, when we finish liturgy or whatever service is being conducted, we'll begin singing Hark the Herald Angel Sing, even before we've left the church. <laughs> right. Um, so, and the kids, we have a little program where the kids will come up and sing some of those, you know, Away in a Manger um, songs in my parish. So, I look at it as an extension of the celebration, inspired by what's happening in the liturgy. So, but, but there, there's a clear delineation. So on my album, when you hear those prayers, almost think of them as like, that's what's setting the stage. That's the backdrop. That's that's the spine of what inspires us. And it's happening sort of as we're departing the service. Now we're going into our homes. Now we're around the campfire. Now we're celebrating with friends and family. Sure. So I think that both spheres can exist. And I'm not even saying that my album should be played in a church service. Like, like let's make that clear. <laughs> so there, there is clear delineation there. And I think that needs to be said. But I do think that Going back centuries in these traditional lands, one thing I discovered is that the liturgical holy tradition always inspires what happens out in our homes. And I think that's even true of like prayer corners. You know, we're trying to like recreate a little church in our home. And I think that's appropriate uh, on some level. So it's only natural that we would be giving thanks to God in, in, uh, in a folky kind of way in our homes as we celebrate outside of what's going on in our liturgical services. Yeah, very good. So, uh, Graham, when will this album be available, and um, how can listeners get a copy of it? It will be available at the beginning of Great and Holy Lent, which I believe falls this year, March 18 of 2024. It will be available on all the streaming platforms, as well as on uh, compact discs. Uh, we, I, I know we mentioned <laughs> earlier about people that could contribute financially if they want to. Uh, one of the reasons I've not pressed this to vinyl Uh, or any of these albums for that matter. It's just because to get vinyl pressed the appropriate way is a big chunk of change and it's just not going to be in the scope of my budget. So if if folks want to see this on vinyl, they are, they can contact me (laughs) and we can, we can get the ball rolling. Um, Also um, as sort of a first time endeavor for this project, I had signs made up that can go in church uh, bookstores and I've already had some Orthodox um, gift shops and bookstores request these. So it's a, it's a little tiny sign. It's like an easel with the album cover, and then it's got two QR codes. So you can just scan it on your smartphone, and it'll take you straight to my Spotify page. And the other code will take you to gramsparkman.com, which is your one-stop shop for all of my music endeavors. And there's a merch section, a news section, a contact section, as I mentioned before. So if that's something that folks listening to this interview, they would like to get one of those little signs. Uh, it's a little more cost effective than ordering CDs. And then you don't have to worry about nobody purchasing them because who listens to CDs much <laughs> these days? <Right. laughs> so it's just an alternative way that people can access the music. Okay. And if they want to contact you directly and, 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 mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, offer some fundraising, po- you know, possibly, or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, have other sorts of requests that relate to your work, uh, how do they go about mm-hmm. doing that? 
Go to GrahamSparkman.com, and that's G-R-A-H-A-M-S-P-A-R-K-M-A-N.com, and click on the tab that says Contact, and you can send a secure message to me, of which I'll receive in my inbox, and then I can reciprocate reach back out to you and we can start our communication that way. And that also works for folks that are interested in ordering t-shirts or merch or CDs or anything for that matter. Perfect. Graham, is there anything else that you would like to add today before I let you go? I just want to say how grateful I am, Bobby, uh, for all the folks at Ancient Faith who have taken the time over the years to support my music and what I do. Uh, I'm truly honored and humbled and grateful. I know that now I know that it's <laughs> it reaches a lot of people just based yeah. on just this reciprocation of folks, like I said, who've, who've gotten back in contact with me that have heard these interviews. So I just want to express my gratitude and just tell you how tremendously grateful I am for your, your time. I appreciate that. Thanks so much for joining me today, Graham. Absolutely, Bobby. Always a pleasure. All right. So once again, I've been speaking with Graham Sparkman. He is the artist behind the new album, Pasca Dawn. I'm Bobby Maddox, and this has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. 